as a black male, I'm expected to perform faster, harder, double work and just go, go, go. You don't have time to be sad. You don't have you don't have the luxury to be depressed and like seek help. I don't have the connection to other people because I don't want them to use it against me to talk about how I feel. And that's a fear. That is a general fear. Someone told me depression could present as anger. And I went, oh my God, all these really, really hard people I know that wake up in the morning mad and want to fight everybody all the time. Could that in fact be a manifestation of depression? Welcome to Hope Starts With Us, a podcast by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm your host, Daniel H. Gillison Jr., NAMI CEO. We started this podcast because we believe that hope starts with us. Hope starts with us talking about mental health. Hope starts with us making information accessible. Hope starts with us providing resources and practical advice. Hope starts with us sharing our stories. Hope starts with us breaking the stigma. If you or a loved one is struggling with a mental health condition and have been looking for hope, we made this podcast for you. Hope starts with all of us. Hope is a collective. We hope that each episode with each conversation brings you into that collective to know you are not alone. Today, I'm joined by Juno Pitchford, NAMI's Manager for Historically Black Colleges and Universities, or HBCUs, and Daniel Hobdy, a volunteer at NAMI Baton Rouge and Peer Support Specialist. October is National Depression Awareness Month, a time of year to educate and to increase awareness and provide resources about depression. More than just feeling sad, depression is a serious mental health condition that can interfere with daily life and normal functioning by affecting the way people think, feel, and handle daily activities, like sleeping, eating, or working. It's a leading risk factor for suicide that affects millions of U.S. adults each year, with more people reaching out for help than ever before since the beginning of the pandemic. While depression can affect anyone, we know that some communities are impacted more than others. For instance, Transgender youth are twice as likely to experience depressive symptoms, seriously consider suicide and attempt suicide compared to their cisgender counterparts. The rate of suicide by veterans is currently at the highest level in history, with annual deaths at over 6,000 veterans per year. And in 2020, the Congressional Black Caucus released a report to Congress showing that the suicide death rate among black youth is increasing faster than any other racial or ethnic group. Juno, Daniel, and I each come from three different generations, but we each attended Southern University and experienced what it was like to seek help for depression as young black men. Today, we want to talk about what's changed over the years, what hasn't, and how we can help reach others in vulnerable communities struggling with symptoms of depression and thoughts of suicide. Juno, let's start with you. Can you start with sharing a little bit of your story with us? Uh, yes, sir. Thanks, Dan, for, for having us here today. This is really special, man. I appreciate it. Uh, I am 53 years old, and uh, so my first e exposure to or experiences with uh, my mental health struggles happened late high school, early college. Uh, uh, as you said, I went to Southern my freshman year of college uh, from Virginia. Um, so there was a bit of culture shock and, uh, it was the first all black environment I'd ever been in. So that definitely made me aware of parts of myself. I hadn't really thought a lot about to that point. Um, I ended up transferring back to Virginia and, and doing pretty well in school and, and making my way, um, as I graduated college um, with a degree in African-American culture, by the way, I feel like I need to say that. Um, so this is more than just who I am. It's also my area of study. Um, that was when things did started not to go to plan, so to speak. There was that old quote, man plans and God laughs. Uh, you know, I, I thought I was going to get out of school and go make records and set the world on fire as a rapper that things didn't go down that way. And, um, I was actually at a 
free clinic for a totally unrelated thing, nothing to do with my mental health. And the lady there, again, this is early 90s, asked me if I wanted an HIV test because that was the mode of the day. Um, everyone needed to get tested at that point. And it scared me to death. I was already a little sketched out about how I was doing. And that I think was kind of a tipping point. And I don't know if it was a poster in the clinic or maybe a phone number on the side of a bus that passed me in downtown Richmond, but somewhere I saw a toll free mental health assessment phone number. And uh, when I got back to my apartment and was by myself and nobody was around, I called this 800 number. And what it was, was a, a automated maybe 50 questions. And based on your responses, it spit out a makeshift diagnosis, if you will. What they told me was seek help immediately. <laughs> Uh, that I had um, severe depression, um, possibly schizophrenic tendencies, suicidal thoughts for sure, and, um, you know, to, to get some help. I, I didn't at that point because I didn't know where or how to begin to go about that, especially with the stigma in my community, uh, the stigma with my family. It wasn't a conversation that was being had by, you know, 20 ish age black kids at the time. Uh, so I, you know, I'm a smart guy. I, I, I read some books. I, I you know, it would get information where I could, as I could, but never didn't want to be in the system, so to speak, if I actually told a doctor that I was having the thoughts I was having and dealing with the things I was dealing with. I'll leave it there for now, but let's just say that the options were few in 1990. And young Dan, I, I'm so glad that, that you have so many more options now and I'll give it back to you guys. Yeah, Juno, thank you for sharing. And, you know, in you sharing and being open and, and, um, uh, really um, articulating when your inflection point, you, you're, you're already helping so many others um, and, and want to hear more about from then to now. Um, and with that said, I want to go to Daniel and uh, Daniel as a peer support specialist. Uh, and with your lived experience, if you will, we would love to hear um, uh, about your experience. When did you recognize uh, your 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 factors of depression, and um, what what was that inflection point for you? Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is uh, Daniel Hobdi. I'm 38. Uh, I'm a peer support specialist. Um, my diagnoses are uh, borderline personality disorder, depression. Uh, PTSD uh, and schizoaffective. Um, I am a suicide survivor, a mental health advocate, and uh, just really glad to be here. Um, I, I, I guess I always had problems with mental health, as many people do. They're just sort of like untalked about or set by the wayside or not recognized for what they were. It was like, oh, that boy's just acting out or he got too much energy or you ain't sad. Uh, but it really took a turn uh, when I got back from Iraq and I got discharged from the army. I, I wasn't the same. And those existing issues compounded with like uh, some later on trauma were a little bit too much. Like, and it all just came spilling out. The things that were uh, less obvious became more pronounced. Like uh, I scared people. I scared myself. Uh, and I'm eternally thankful to my mom and dad for having the resources and the wherewithal to be like, okay, this, this needs to be addressed. So my first introduction to serious mental health in that conversation, uh, like was with the VA and I went in and I got an assessment and they're like, man, <laughs> I think you should see somebody <laughs> and that that was a real humbling experience because for me, it was, it was like, we, we acknowledge it, but we don't talk about it. It's, it's like, 
It's like, what's in that closet over there? Don't look in that closet over there. We, that's that's a bunch of mess. That's you know that room in your house the guests aren't allowed into. That was my mental. Wow. I got into the VA system, wow. and from there, I got some treatment for my PTSD, and that uh, unlocked uh, my willingness to start exploring some of the other issues that bothered me. And I was like, man, this runs deep. Like, I had stuff before the army, and I had stuff during the army. I had stuff out of the army, and I had stuff that affected my parents. I had theirs, and like, I just. It was sort of like whenever you put on glasses for the first time for our non-vision havers, it's like you, you see the world blurry and you're, you're cool with it. And then you put on glasses. For me, that was my first uh, introduction to mental health. And then the world just becomes a lot clearer. You see all that you've been missing. And um, that's when I started my road. It, and I, I got to say, it's a road I'll travel every day for the rest of my life. And I'm happy for it. Um, for me, uh, there are a bunch of resources available, but uh, uh, having access and navigating those was a little bit more difficult than I ever thought. Um, finding out who I would have to talk to, the appointments, like where to go for this, finding out a circle of people I could trust, and it, it was a lot, but I know they're out there, and so I... I'm a big proponent of shepherding people or shepherding them to the mountaintop of healing. Daniel, first and foremost, um, uh, NAMI always uh, recognizes our veterans, and we want to thank you for your service. Uh, and you mentioned being a, um, a veteran um, serving in the U.S. Army and being deployed to Iraq and how things changed as you um, um, left the military, if you will. Uh, after after your service in Iraq. And what I'm hearing, though, in terms of what you do now is that you, you, you're a soldier, but you're a soldier with a different cause. And I love the visual that you just gave about, you know, someone has, you know, th their vision is not clear. And all of a sudden they put on these glasses that have a prescription in them. And then all of a sudden they can see. That's so vivid. And thank you for sharing that. Um, and uh, appreciate uh, what you're what you're doing. And and how you're soldiering forward. So, and thank you for your military service. We greatly appreciate it. So with that said, what I want to say to you all is, is that I'm from a different generation and in my college days were in the seventies. And while I was in college, I wrote a poem while I was uh, uh, there at Southern 1200 miles from home. The title of it was depression in me. And I remember vividly what it was like to be a young person having to deal with all the pressures of being away from home for the first time, making my own decisions and really figuring out, what was going on with me, who I was, what 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 were these feelings that I had? Um, and I know firsthand what it's like to wrestle with messages about being a man, meaning you aren't supposed to cry. Shake it off. You know, hey, you know, everything is OK. Uh, you know, that's just a moment in time. And especially the mental health stigmas and barriers faced by black men in particular. A lot has changed since then and a lot hasn't. So let's take some time to talk more about that. Um, there's three generations of lived experience represented here. What do you all feel uh, that has changed over the years in terms of stigma, access to care, and so forth in your experience? And Juno, let's start with you. This, obviously, just uh, the, the fact that three of us from three different generations could even have this conversation opportunities like this, th this did not happen when I was a young man. So I'm sure it didn't happen when you were a young man, Dan. I, I'm sure that, you know, Daniel spoke about the closet and there's that closet over there, but we don't look in that closet. And I remember being a, a, a little boy growing up here in, in Fredericksburg. And there was a, a gentleman a block over who had been to Vietnam. And he had come home and had all kinds of what we now know to be trauma and mental health issues. And he would, you know, stand out on the corner and yell at the passing cars and, and everybody in the neighborhood knew him. And I'm going to say his name, Mr. Mr. Cavanaugh, because you got to put some respect on the name. Mr. Cavanaugh wasn't right. And everybody knew it, but nobody did anything about it. He always looked out for us kids running around and don't go in the street. And, you know, he wasn't a, a threat 
to anyone, but he needed some help. And that was, you know, during your time that you were older, that was seventies. I was a little kid then, but I remember seeing him. And then I remember when I started to have my problems, am I going to be Mr. Kavanaugh? Because my community's not talking about these things. I don't feel like I can go to anyone around. And this is the nineties. Now we're, you know, 20 years down the road, I'm still feeling like I'm going to be out there standing on the corner yelling at folks because I don't know how to. And I come from a, you know, a very, very, uh, in, I, I won't say into educated family. You know, my grandmother went to college, which was rare for that time. So here are these folks who, you know, know how to navigate stuff, but not this. <laughs> this is not something we do in our community. So the fact that we can all be here, the fact that you sent us an email this week talking about how mental health has surpassed COVID as the biggest concern in the country. Not that that's something to feel good about, but the fact that enough people were willing to say this concerns me right now shows progress. And, and for us, and, you know, uh, as we started, someone mentioned Megan the Stallion. Well, go back 20 years. I remember when, when the Ghetto Boys had a big hit song called My Mind's Playing Tricks on Me. That, that was, you know, the writer of that record, Scarface. Uh, we gonna put some respect on him. Talked about how that record, which we thought was gangster rap, was actually his take on a manic depressive, a schizophrenic and a person living with suicidal tendencies. We didn't know that's what it was, but we all heard the record and was like, yeah, that's been me. I get that. We just didn't have the vocabulary of mental health to talk about it in the ways that are accepted by the mainstream. So now, you know, now it's second nature that, that young folks now, you know, well, I suffer from X, Y. Oh, really? Well, I have this, this, this. And, Nobody looks at you sideways. You just keep it moving because it's part of the culture more and more. Daniel, um, do you feel like there are particular stigmas black men face when it comes to talking about depression? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Empirically, yes. Um, I know uh, I'm going to speak from my personal experience. I, and knowing what I know now, I know my father uh, the amount of burden that he shouldered, and I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing his story. He uh, came from a real small town, uh, Alexandria, Louisiana. Uh, if you never heard about it, you probably would never understand it, but like it's one horse town might be universally accepted. But like uh, my grandmother was a hairdresser and she raised her kids. My dad ended up getting a scholarship to Harvard. He was told he had to be a doctor. Like, you know, he had this plan set forth, but again, you know, you want to make God laugh, like <laughs> tell him your plans. But uh, the universe and the world had something other in store for him. So he dealt with some shame and guilt and just frustration for not accomplishing what he thought he had to do. And, uh, you know, he he never shared that with me until later on in life. And like that hurt me knowing that he didn't have an avenue for that. And for me, uh, having that generational shame and guilt for not living up, not amounting to, and not being able to voice it or feeling like I had to when the option was there. The fact that like we all share this common like fear uh, of being able to talk and not be strong enough. Cause I know for me as a black male, I'm expected to perform faster, harder, double work and just go, go, go. You don't have time to be sad. You don't have, you don't have the luxury to be depressed and like seek out. I, I, I don't have the connection to other people because I don't want them to use it against me to talk about how I feel. And that's a fear. That is a general fear. Like I, like we are, fear is the mind killer. That is, that is one of my favorite lines from Dune. Like, and it's never struck to her, but my fear doesn't just exist for spiders and skeletons and vampires. No, my fear exists for like, fear of not being enough, fear of like, you know, invasive thoughts, fear of not maybe to get my rent or take care of kids or like all these fears and like they, they build and like they stack and they stack and they stack. And then if anybody's played Jenga, you know, you stack that tower high enough and you take out one block, it all falls down. Having people now in my life, like uh, Juno, like, and you, like, and having people I can call and 
make me feel okay. And that made me feel included. And that like, I'm not alone. Like it's, it's meant the world to me. And um, I'm not, I'm not gonna, and I, and I can cry now. Like I, I can cry in front of other grown men and not feel weird about it. Like, you know, that's, yeah, it's, it's worth its weight in gold. Juno, you mentioned the ghetto boys and something that they wrote uh, some 20 years ago. And if we look at where we are now in 2022, I want to ask you both, how would you describe depression to someone who doesn't know what it is? And how can someone know the difference, whether they are depressed or just feeling sad? I think for the context of where we are today and this conversation we're having, um, the scholar in me, when I was told you're severely depressed, went and found as many definitions as I could um, from you're sad and you don't know why, as, as opposed to, you know, someone ran over your dog and you know why you're sad, but that same feeling, but there's no catalyst. That's one definition I was getting. Um, sadness that lingers over a period of time. Um, you know, I, and that is the one I point out most often when people go, are you depressed again? No, I'm just having a crappy day. I'll be better again tomorrow. That's different from a month of constantly feeling bad and not knowing why. Uh, but I think the most profound definition I found was when someone um, told me depression could present as anger. And I went, oh, my God. All these really, really hard people I know that wake up in the morning mad and want to fight everybody all the time. Could that, in fact, be a manifestation of depression? And then I had to turn that same mirror on myself and go, wait, is this why I'm always walking around with my face scrunched up and my fist made, you know, just walking through a 7-Eleven, not even going anywhere important, just in, <laughs> in my everyday life. This is my depression that's going, I feel crappy, but because I'm a black man in America, as Dan said earlier, I don't have that luxury of feeling crappy. So what do I replace that with? I replace that with anger and posture. And I'm going to puff my chest out and frown my face. And if I'm scary enough, Everybody will leave me alone so they won't know, like, they won't find out that I'm really sad and I'm crying on the inside, you know? And, and so, so that's the part of the definition of depression that I want to turn a light to, because I think that is very prevalent in our community is people who feel bad. The defense mechanism is to, you know, posture yourself in a way that people don't bother you. Yeah, you put your armor on. I uh, got you, Juno. Thank you. You put your armor on, uh, whether it's in a 7-Eleven or, or where it might be. And you need to find a place where you can actually take that armor off and 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 be your true self, as as Daniel said. Daniel, as a peer support specialist, um, how do you help a, a person um, with that with that question of whether or not they are depressed or just having a bad day? Um, actually, you gave me one of my favorite. Uh, catchphrases and I've been practicing it without uh, realizing it people don't care what you know until they know that you care um, that that phrase helped change my life but uh and Juno showed it to me when I met him and I try to show that same compassion and grace to other people as a peer I share my experience strength and hope and let them know it's okay I, I have great days I have manic days I have bad days. I have real bad days. But at, at the worst part of those, like I, I had days in the past where I felt and I say this phrase and I know somebody out there is going to recognize it. You're going to feel a light come on in you. And that I want you to know if you recognize this phrase, like maybe not the words, but the feeling, then you're not alone. I was soul tired. And that was a form of depression for me that like it was physical, it was mental, it was emotional. I just I just wanted it all to stop. I'm not gonna get into that because if you know, you know. But there's hope. On the other side, man, it's it's bright. But getting through it, like uh getting through that depression of not wanting to get out of bed or 
just being angry and not knowing why because I can't figure out why I'm angry. Like Juno said, I'm angry because I can't figure why I'm hurting and I don't have an outlet to be hurt. So I'm angry at other people and they get angry at me and I have to posture and like I, I'm just mad. I'm, I'm mad at the world for the world being the world and me not being able to be a part of it because I'm hurt. And it, it's this whole feedback loop of just pain. The worst part of that feedback loop, man, it just feeds into itself. It just goes and goes and goes and goes. But like uh, for me and helping other people uh, through this shared experience is to normalize that being present, being being there all the time, anytime. And, you know, knowing that someone cares and like making it okay. It's like it doesn't happen overnight. Like sometimes it does. Sometimes you meet somebody and be like, I can trust them. I know they know what I'm going through, but starting that conversation and being aware that like, it doesn't happen overnight. You gotta be consistent with it. It's like, hey man, are you okay? How are you doing? Like anybody can be a flash in the pan and ask you, it's like, man, you doing all right? They don't wanna hear, they don't know that you really care. Do you, re- you want the real answer? No, I'm not doing all right today. <laughs> I'm having a really bad day. But when you consistently show up and you're you're present and you provide them that opportunity like i'm not feeling good we can break that feedback loop and we can stop being so angry and we can start a healing process at least for me and thank you uh daniel and juno i think that the um um, as you 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 mentioned something earlier about fear and then with fear comes doubt but what also comes is that when you do that self-reflection and you put those those glasses on of that peer specialist support and the Juno reaching out to the Daniel and the Daniel um, reaching out to the Juno there there you get clarity and with clarity there's purpose and there's hope so um, that is that is something that's very important some of the symptoms of depression are uh, being withdrawn someone that all of a sudden was very social and now they're withdrawn uh, they, they they don't get out of the bed uh, their patterns of sleep change their eating habits change their disposition is 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 measurably different uh, those are those are some of the some of the key factors or key symptoms of someone uh, being depressed if someone is struggling with depression or thoughts of suicide, what can they do to find help? What feels like a million options compared to 30 years ago when I was you know, looking at these kinds of, of things, but to make it more organic than even, you know, finding a doctor or finding a program or finding a group or any of those things, I think it's a conversation. And the first conversation is with yourself, because if you cannot talk to yourself and admit to yourself, I need to do something about the way I've been feeling, then all the other steps that come after that are moot. So so it's the first, the internal conversation, and then it becomes maybe it's your support group, or maybe it's your partner, maybe it's a parent, maybe... Whoever is that person you trust, then maybe you have to practice it there first before you have the strength and courage to practice it with a provider or a group or a nonprofit or, you know, whatever the next layer is for the brain is there's so we know a lot, but there's a whole lot more we don't know about the brain. One thing we do know is that they're each individual and that it's not an exact science. So what worked for me may not be what worked for Daniel. What worked for Daniel may not be what worked for Dan. They're bu- it's a buffet. You know what I mean? You, you take the parts that work for you, leave the stuff that doesn't work for you. But uh, first and foremost, have that honest conversation with yourself and get yourself to a place where then you can open that conversation to someone close to you that is trusted and, and take steps from there. That's my recommendation. 
Thank you, Juno. You know, it's a it's about meeting people where they are, not where you want them to be. And that starts with that self-reflection and, you know, meeting yourself where you are. And, you know, if you tweak your knee or you 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 tweak a shoulder or hurt a hip or something, you, you, you might get up and you recognize, oh, something's something's not right with this. And you may even share that with your partner or with a good friend. But if you're not in touch with what's happening above your shoulders um, or if you are in touch with it, um, let's say you are in touch with it will you share it and and i think that operative word that you mentioned juno so critically important trust t-r-u-s-t trust is critically important from the standpoint of having that trusted friend um, um, uh, that peer that you can speak to honestly that will meet you where you are daniel what what are your thoughts on that question if someone is struggling with depression um, or thoughts of suicide what can they do to find help I agree. Like uh, with a lot of the statements that were said earlier, uh, the first part is uh, accepting that you have a problem and then uh, acceptance, surrender and solution is the way I look at it. Like for me, like surrender, accepting that that I had a problem and I was going to the VA for the first time and getting diagnosis. I'm a fighter, man. Like most of us guys out there are like fighting is what we do. We're out here fighting for uh, our fair shake. We're out here fighting for our families. We're out here fighting for our country. We're out here fighting just just to make it through the day. Like, I don't know how to stop fighting, but I do know how to surrender now. Surrender to something better and like surrender to help. And sometimes surrender is the best option. You don't want to lose all your forces fighting. Sometimes surrender. That's that's good. And then once I surrendered, I started looking for help and I, I, I got mentors now and I, I read some books. I went to some groups. I, I started doing things. I started rediscovering new coping mechanisms like, like right now, like I got happiness cake because I did something good, you know, <laughs> uh, but you you change it up like you change the script and it can work. Um, there are resources out there now like I, I don't know how it looked for you guys, and I'd love to have another conversation about that, but like now we have stuff like 988. Well, 988, uh, we have crisis intervention centers. We have uh, Zoom mental health meetings. We have these new things that's like coming out, healing circles, which essentially is just a barbershop. Like, you know, you, you talk about things that are going on with you. You get some advice from like people like Dan and the Juno, and then he's like, man, maybe I should take a look at that, you know? And like we have all these new elements and like Juno said, like not every solution is going to work for you. And that's cool, man, because like there's many different ways to get it. It's like Blaskin Robbins of healing. Like we got 31 flavors of mental health. We can we can supply it all. And like I know for me, uh, again, being a fighter, like and as a black male, like uh, I'm about that healing. My depression can you can get these healing and my depression can catch these hands. That's the way I'm at it. Like, uh, I got people I can trust and I got resources and I know it's out there. And like, if I can do it, I want to show someone else they can do it because being the best version of me allows me to be the best version of a son. It allows me to be the best version of a godfather. It allows me to be the best version as a peer support specialist. It allows me to be the best version of a dog dad. Like what, whatever it looks like for me, when we start taking care of the internal and we start looking for that help, then we can step our game up, right? Like, because <laughs> I'm trying to be the best. Never settle. Juno and I actually met Daniel in Baton Rouge back in August when we went to Southern University on behalf of NAMI National to help with an event on campus for students wellness. We wanted to be there in part to respond after hearing that a freshman student athlete, Arlana Miller, had lost her life to suicide. June and I had both attended Southern, and we just knew we had to get out there somehow. We had to get to Baton Rouge. We ended up making some so many meaningful connections, one of them being with this young man here, Daniel. Just two weeks after we left, one of our connections told us that five more black men lost their lives to suicide during that time. This weighed on me and continues to weigh on me and, and, and more than you could ever know. 
So many people out there are hurting, including the families who have to cope with these losses. When I think about my own family and the aftermath of losing my own contemporary to suicide, I often wonder what things would have been like back then if we had known about resources like NAMI. For too long, communities of color have not known about, had access to, or maybe even wanted to access the same mental health services due to stigma and mistrust of systems that are supposed to help. But we're a part of an organization and a movement and a time when people want to help. So my question for you is, what can the mental health field do to better engage with HBCUs and communities of color and black youth who are struggling? This is the first answer, you know, is is uh, to start having these conversations and to start using whatever platforms we have. Uh, so the fact that you would want to have this conversation as, as part of your podcast is is a step in that direction. I'll just, you know, keep it 100 real talk, man. I'm, I'm a, a big fan of, of Drink Champs and they talk about giving people their flowers while they're here to receive them. So I need you to get your flowers right now, Dan, that you're, you're doing. Lead by example, be the change you want to see. And this is part of that, you know, having these conversations in these public forums and using your platform. Um, beyond that, the brick and mortar restaurant model of, of our NAMI office is in this particular part of town. And if you want, you know, NAMI services come over here. Uh, and that kind of holds true for a lot of the mental health organizations of, you know, this is where our thing is. These are the events we do. It's got to change it to something a little more like Uber Eats or, or DoorDash where, uh, you know, we have to take the stuff where the people are. That's the first step. Um, and, and, you know, let the people take what they want from it. Um, you know, this, this misconception that black communities don't care about mental health or don't respond to, to efforts to, to bring it to the community. That's a fallacy. It just looks different. So maybe it's not always recognized by the mainstream, uh, but it's going on and, and, you know, support what's already there is what, mainstream mental health organizations can do is find out what's already happening and what do they need. And much like what happened at Southern, when we went out there, it, it wasn't, we're coming in to do a NAMI presentation. It was, here's some resources. How can we support all the stuff you've already got going on here in Baton Rouge? Gina, I 100% agree. Um, I don't see a need to build Rome when you already got the infrastructure. Like, if. There's organizations out there that are boots on ground. They have a connection to Pulse. Like they, they've been trying and struggling to do it with what they got. NAMI is huge. Like the way I got introduced to NAMI was from uh, someone I truly respect. And like, I look at her as a mentor too, Michelle Graffia. Graffia. And uh, she, she ran healing circles and whatnot, but she told me, it's like, I don't want to go change anything. I want to just support things. And she shows up she's consistent and she doesn't try to enforce like this is the way we're doing it but no she sees the beauty in these like small little groups it's like you know they they have a brunch group that goes out and do over here in fact there's some healing circles starting up at southern right now by some wonderful young ladies that the amount of self-awareness that they had blew me away like and these were nurse people studying to be nurses and they had this beautiful dialogue they all they really need is like some mentorship and like maybe they can point to resources or teach someone to help run a group. And there these resources out there are maybe some of these student athletes that might can use some like help because that's a lot of pressure like going on or, you know, people working in their master's program like that. That's that's a different sort of pressure cooker. But like if NAMI could provide those resources uh, like maybe there's like a, a peer that is going through it or a mentorship for as far as mental health. They have AA and NA, but like a mental health, like, you know, sponsorship or pairing up people with like therapists. Like I think everybody should have a therapist. Uh, I, I believe that uh, NAMI as an organization isn't cookie cutter. I, I, I'm going on NAMI. I've met NAMI members. They are a different they're a different breed. There's a flavor for everybody. And having that different flavor to fit in where we fit in and support, that's what it's about. And I'm proud to be a part of it. 
for the first time in a long time, I'm proud to be a part of a giant organization that, that has a single-minded purpose, and it's to get that healing, no matter what it looks like for that community. Daniel and Juno, we're so proud that you are with us. And uh, Daniel, we're so proud that you elected uh, to uh, to be a peer support specialist and to volunteer and to be one of our one of our uh, hundreds of volunteers who are making a difference in the communities in which they they live. Uh, and we just appreciate that so much. Juno and Daniel, what I want to say is thanks to both of you. You know, the world can be a difficult place and sometimes it can be hard to hold on to hope. That's why each week we dedicate the last couple of minutes of our podcast to a segment we call Hold On to Hope. Juno and Daniel, you have both expressed that you've been there. You know that place of hopelessness, yet you've come out the other side. Can you tell us what helps you hold on to hope? Perhaps my favorite quote, Dan, I know you're a big quote guy, so so here's one for you. Um, The great Che Guevara said, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, may I say, that the true revolutionary is guided by great feelings of love. And that is uh, the answer to what gave me hope, love. The, the idea that there is still love in the world. The idea that I might find love someday and get married. The idea that my mama loved me or that my friends loved me. It, it, the, the idea that for all the bad, when it felt like everything was bad and darkness, that there was still this thing called love that I could aspire to. And that if I could hold on long enough, you know, the clouds would part and there would be love in whatever guys on the other side of that. I I truly believe if you can just sustain and hold yourself together long enough, you will find that again, it's out there. It's in the universe, you know, uh, uh, DJ Collis said, God did, you know, they didn't believe, but, but God did, God believed in me and, and kept me going. And, and so I'm still here and now I can pay it forward to everyone else. Thank you, Juno. And thank you for paying it forward. And, uh, Daniel, what gives you hope? This conversation right here. Um, the fact that there is now another generation of healing. So one day there will be a conversation with four generations of healing and then another generation, there'll be five and then six. Uh, I was in a very deep valley of despair and I had people like um, one of my mentors, Tanja Miles, and I have a Juno, I have a Michelle, and I climbed out that pit and stood on their shoulders so I could see the future and it's bright. I know for me, the opposite, opposite of uh, addiction and fear and worry and isolation is connection and consistency. Because people don't care what you know until they know you care. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and I did not know that as I as I shared that quote there in Baton Rouge that it would have such a uh, a lasting impact. And thank you. I uh, appreciate that very much. And, you know, there's another one I want to share with you all. And um, Juno has heard this before. It's an African proverb. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's what this is about is going together because we want to go far. Uh, and it's going to take us going together to go far and also being vulnerable and having trust. So I appreciate you guys in terms of you being vulnerable and having the trust in this platform and in NAMI and sharing your stories. Um, We are very excited about the way forward. We're very excited of where we are in 2022 and where we're going in 2023 and beyond and our new outreach um, and uh, what we're going to do uh, uh, together uh, to reach so many young people. And we want to be proactive so we can really minimize the reactive pain that we have to to, to navigate as our, our young uh, college student and her family um, had went through there at, at Southern as a student athlete. Um, so that's the mission. And we appreciate you all being so much a part of it. And um, we're just excited to work with you uh, as we go forward. And as our, our, our men are navigating things, you, you, you mentioned trust and we talked about armor. Uh, we have a, another project called the Confess Project where it's working with black men in barbershops. And what we find there is that these men, as you see them approaching the barbershop, you can tell that they have their armor on. 
And as soon as they walk in the door, they drop it at the door and they sit down in that barber's chair, someone that they may have known like this for three generations. And what the, the, the barber is equipped with if they've gone through the training is how to listen, uh, actively listen, intentionally listen and provide them with some information on resources in terms of uh, reaching out to NAMI and looking for different resources uh, for uh, what they may be experiencing. And then you notice that person get out of the chair and they're thankful, they're, they're appreciative. And as they approach the front door, one of the things that we noticed when we sat in a barbershop for hours is that it was almost like they picked up this virtual armor and they put it back on when they walked out the door. So we have to make sure that we can drop that armor when we come into each other's social circles uh, and that we uh, create judgment-free zones for people to rap, to talk, uh, and um, for us to, to really connect with our true selves. Daniel and Juno, you, you all were talking about resources. And Juno, you alluded to 20 years ago, there was a rapper in a group called Ghetto Boys. And, 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 and there was this piece that he did and he didn't recognize what he was doing, but he was talking about mental health and, 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 and mental crisis and, and, and mental illness and navigating that space and living with it. And, and, and not only living with it, but but doing well with it. How has that come uh, so far? Because we now have even more spoken word. We have so much in prose. We have hip hop. We have rap. We see Megan the Stallion, who is, is actually creating a website or has created a website that's actually looking at uh, mental illness and, and mental health in, in, in the black community. So what are you all seeing now in terms of other kinds of uh, platforms? There was a time when the, the platform platform was faith-based, uh, and that's still a strong, trusted uh, component. But we're seeing the barbershop conversations. We're seeing rappers. We're seeing artists. We're, we're seeing all of these different uh, uh, patches on this quilt that is so critically important in the community. We have sharing hope. Uh, so what do you all see as we think about what Megan the Stallion has just done uh, with, with her voice? Um, the short answer is progress, uh, is what I see. It's progress. The irony here that, that's not lost on me is the ghetto boys that, that I mentioned earlier are from Houston. And so is Megan. So I don't know if there's something in the water down there or if it's, it's something in how our communities move in that part of the country, but that she would carry on the narrative started by the ghetto, ghetto boys all those years ago and put it into this modern interpretation of, you know, rappers didn't build websites back then. There, there was, you know, probably three websites in the world at that point. But uh, so it, it's progress that, that we're creating more and more lanes for us to have these conversations. Yeah, we saw a few years back Taraji P. Henson, and she created the Boris Henson Foundation. We're seeing sororities and fraternities get involved. Uh, there's so many patches that we're that we're creating. It's it's how do we actually operationalize them and make sure that we stand them up? Because you know the the, the saying in the church as the uh, as the praises go up, the blessings come down. So how do we make sure that that we those blessings come down and 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 we do that? Uh, Daniel, any comments? Yeah, uh, definitely. Like, I, I I love this part of this conversation because, like, from the Hot Boys to Master P, who's super involved with the community, and Meg the Stallion. By, by the way, by her record, girls, good. Um, we're changing the culture because we can't know there's something better unless we see it. Like, it's hard to envision new things, but if we see and prop them up and put them on, put some respect on their names. You know, as a mentor would say, we, we're changing the culture, what it looks like, what people see in media. Like we, we're breaking away from the three archetypes, archetypes of black males in film and, you know, radio. And we're talk, having these conversations in music and these these personalities are talking about body positive images. They're, they're talking about like mental health. And I want I want to point them out. We are so quick to uh, point out uh, what someone's doing wrong, but I want to, I want to, I want to put some respect on that name and lift them up when they're doing what's right. For me, it's almost labeling them hidden heroes. And how do we bring the hidden heroes to the front? 
Uh, and you, you guys have articulated it so well. And the genres that are out there now are not the genres in terms of music. You know, I grew up with a whole different uh, uh, group of music called Motown. And the music of today is different than that music of the 60s and 70s. But it's still delivering that message. If you think about what Marvin Gaye said, if you think about what the Temptations were saying, if you think about what the Four Tops were saying and, and some of the music that was created back then with the OJs and the Delphonics. I'm taking you all back to my time, but where I'm coming to is full circle to now. It's still hidden heroes and making sure that we raise them up so that we can understand what they're doing and, and articulating to help so many. So Juno Pitchford and Daniel Hobdy, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your lived experience. This has been Hope Starts With Us, a podcast by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. If you're looking for mental health resources, you're not alone. To connect with the NAMI helpline and find local resources, visit nami.org forward slash help. Text helpline to 62640 or dial 800-950-6264 or NAMI. Or if you are experiencing an immediate suicide or substance use or mental health crisis, please call or text 988 to speak with a trained support specialist or visit 988lifeline.org. To order NAMI's new book, You Are Not Alone, The NAMI Guide to Navigating Mental Health, visit nami.org forward slash not alone book. I'm Dan Gillison, NAMI CEO. Thank you for joining us and be well.